China Global Television Network. Warm welcome to Global Business, coming to you live from Kenya's capital, Nairobi, where it's 9 p.m. I am Penny Nakarib, and thank you for joining us. As always, we begin with a look at the market. South African stocks slip to a near six-month low today after the U.S. Treasury bond yield curve inverted for the first time since 2007, reflecting concerns over the outlook for the world's biggest economy. Both of the country's major stock indexes weakened more than 2% following the inversion in the U.S. debt market, a situation where shorter dated borrowing costs are higher than longer ones. The JC All Share dipped by over two percentage points, closing at 54,000.45 points. Coming up on the show tonight. Nigeria blocks its central bank from providing foreign exchange for food imports. US President Donald Trump delays tariffs on key goods from China until December. And a recycling project keeps South African township streets clean while creating employment for the community. Let's begin in Zimbabwe, where businesses have begun enjoying more regular electricity supplies following an increase in imports from South Africa. At the moment, the Southern African country is receiving an additional 400 megawatts per week from ESCOM as it tries to ease its crippling power crisis. With the details, ECGTN's Farai Mokutuya. Three days of continuous power have put this flour milling plant back in business. Its owner has his fingers crossed the situation holds. We are happy that the power is back. We saw improvement uh, as from Saturday last week. And uh, the food production is now commenced. However, uh, the losses of the past eight weeks will probably require us to work in order to recover a full throttle for the next eight months to recover from the eight weeks. This is in respect of outstanding orders that we had, the fixed costs that we incurred during that time, uh, the labor that we had to pay whilst uh, you know, workers remained idle. Elsewhere, small businesses that were working by night to beat the load shedding are enjoying a return to relative normalcy. This period has been abnormal. We are solely dependent on electricity. If it's not available, we can't work. So we are happy that there are deals in place to secure more power. But the situation remains precarious, as dangerous as these makeshift connections. So any extra hours of power are a big deal, not just for the individual businesses, but for an economy encountering several headwinds. Foods industry just like anywhere else in the world is a volumes game we have to produce uh, high volume so that uh, there is uh, more than what what demand requires and the unit cost becomes lower so when we have a situation of uh, low productivity uh, it impacts on the food supply itself and further uh, impacts also on food prices the government says it's negotiating for more imports, which it's relying on until depleted water levels at the main hydropower station in Kariba are replenished after the next rainy season. In the long term, it plans to accelerate the implementation of new power projects as well as the refurbishment of existing ones to bring them back up to full capacity in order to avert the recurrence of a similar crisis. Farang Wakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. In Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari has told the central bank to stop providing funding for food imports. The latest move comes only weeks after central bank governor Godwin Emifiele said the bank would ban access to foreign exchange to import milk. Since Buhari first took office in 2015, Nigeria's central bank has presided over policies aimed at stimulating growth in the agricultural sector to reduce dependence on oil. Those policies included, included a 2015 ban on access to foreign exchange for 41 items that the bank felt could be produced in Nigeria. The Nigerian president's statement has raised questions about the bank's independence political and economic experts in the west african nation say the central bank act of 2007 makes it clear that the bank is not supposed to take directives from the government 
All right, let's get more details from Deji Badmas, his life for us in Lagos. So Deji, doesn't this directive contradict the Central Bank Act, which makes it clear the bank is independent? Is the bank likely to act on this directive? Well, Penina, on the face of it, it would appear to be so that it actually contradicts. But the, the, the fact is that, look, the issue of the independence of uh, the bank now in terms of its relationship now with um, the president of the country has been, uh, you know, an ongoing debate, so to speak. Remember, we had this kind of debate when a former president, Goodluck Jonathan, fired the central bank governor back then in 2014 or 2013. If you still remember, it threw up a lot of debate as to whether the president had the power to do that. But, but in this case now, it's understandable that people, uh, you know, the issue of the independence of the bank has also come to the fore now because of the directive that the president has given. But my take is this. Look, what the president said is exactly what the central bank had been doing, even before the president actually came to say it. Uh, before now, the central bank had actually been trying to encourage backward integration. It had been carrying out this policy. I mean, uh, not just a few weeks ago, you remember the central bank announced that it was actually uh, restricting Forex now to uh, those who were importing milk, that it was trying to encourage um, local production of milk in this country. And you talk about the ban of those uh, 41 or 44 items now. It's also part of the policy. So it, it's quite understandable that this, is, uh, this has thrown up uh, this kind of debate now over the independence of the bank. But uh, whether we like it or not, look, we would always see this kind of thing. It's, it's always been there. And uh, even after this presidency, it, it will continue to be there. Because when you have a situation where the president actually appoints a central bank governor, appoints uh, the, the members of the uh, Monetary Policy Committee, it's difficult when you have that kind of situation not to have at least some kind of interference. It's now up to the bank's management now, um, you know, to know how to control things and assert uh, the, the, their independence. All right, so Deji, initially the central bank had placed a ban on access to foreign exchange for items the bank felt could be produced in Nigeria. You mentioned them, 41, 44, given whatever number that was. But with this new directive, which now covers even items not produced in Nigeria, what impact is this likely to have on the country's food security? And by the way, Deji, this is bearing in mind, uh, you know, items such as rice that we know they've been smuggling. The smugglers have been getting this rice from neighboring countries such as Benin. So what's the impact of all of this on Nigeria's food security? Now, Padina, let's, let's get one thing straight. We're, we're not absolutely sure that uh, this directive uh, you know, that it covers those items that cannot be produced in Nigeria. We're not setting. We're not setting about that because um, it's, it's, it's common knowledge that for those items or those things that you actually cannot produce in this country, it, it just wouldn't make sense at all to place uh, some kind of forest restriction on them. And by the way, this is forest restriction. It's not a ban on importation. It, it basically means uh, people could still import them, but they cannot approach the central bank now for forex. So, you know, they would not be able to get forex for cheap. So they can actually go out to the market and source their own forex, but they cannot actually approach um, the central bank now for forex. So it's not an outright ban. That has to be made very clear. Now, uh, in terms of rice import, you're, you're quite right. Um, as a result of the policy we've seen, I'm talking about the, 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 this policy of backward integration. Remember, the federal government introduced the Ancos Boroughs program that the CBN is actually funding. And through that program, we've seen rice uh, production, uh, you know, actually shoot up. Uh, at the moment, Nigeria's production capacity is estimated to be close to self-sufficiency. The target is to achieve self-sufficiency in rice production by 2020. Of course, we still have the issue of smuggling. People are still smuggling rice into uh, the country. It's not as if there's a ban on the importation of rice. Uh, the ban we have is the ban on importation through land borders. So people could still import rice through uh, the, uh, the, the, the seaport, so to speak. Uh, so now, the reason why you have this import or the problem of uh, smuggling now is because some of the smuggled rice are actually cheaper uh, than the locally produced rice. But the fact is that in terms of production capacity, that has actually gone up. And what we've seen is that 
rice growers and uh, rice millers, of course, have come together. They are doing something uh, to bring down the cost of rice. We're beginning to see local the price of local rice now come down. So in terms of impact, to be candid, Penina, I, I think um, the impact has actually been positive. When you look at uh, the rice policy of the government, the wheat policy, you look at uh, the backward integration policy of the government, I, I think it's, it's been quite, quite positive. The food import bill has dramatically gone down. Uh, and what the CBN is trying to do is to ensure that uh, at least the food import bill comes down, down to a very manageable level. Uh, because, um, look, what we spend importing food in this country is, is quite huge. And uh, it continues to eat a deep into uh, the country's foreign reserve. And, and what the CBN is trying to do is to manage that. It's, it's actually the policy of the government. And what the CBN is doing is basically follow that policy. All right. So since Buhari took office in 2015, the central bank has presided over policies aimed at stimulating growth in the agricultural sector to reduce dependence on oil. Has this produced tangible results so far? Yes, absolutely. Look, I, I talked about the Anchors Borrowers Program, and that's the first thing the government of this country would point to in terms of its agriculture policy now. The Anchors Borrowers Program has seen the central bank pumping in around $480 million in the last uh, five years. And uh, to be candid, the impact has been dramatic. We've seen uh, the increase now in the production capacity, rice production capacity, that has actually gone up. Um, as a matter of fact, we understand our self-sufficiency. Uh, there's, there's a chance that the country might achieve self-sufficiency now by uh, 2020. But no doubt at all that uh, rice production has actually gone up. Uh, you talk about wheat production too, the same thing. Um, or the cash crop as well. And, and that's why it's because of the positive impact uh, that the government has seen. Uh, that's the reason why the CBN uh, decided to introduce uh, the, the recent milk policy where it's uh, restricting uh, you know, access to forex now for, for milk importation and actually trying to encourage a backward integration now in, in the milk industry. So it, it's, it's been quite massive. We've seen jobs created, especially in, in the agriculture sector. The government will tell you that uh, through the Anchors Boras program, it's been able to create directly now about 2.5 million jobs and indirectly uh, close to 5 million jobs. So uh, everybody knows that the policy has been very good and quite impactful. Um, and, and what people are saying is that the, the, the government and, of course, the central bank actually uh, need to scale up that policy so as to reach out to uh, more farmers. And as a result of the policy, let me just add quickly, we're beginning to see more and more young people now uh, go back to the farm. All right, Deji, let's leave it there for now. Thank you for those insights. Deji Badmas, live for us in Lagos. Coming up next, we look at your corporate headlines. We begin in South Africa and brittle giant Steinhoff says it has refinanced some $10 billion of debt in its overseas operations. As of Wednesday, the group's European subsidiaries implemented a financial restructuring plan after pushing it repeatedly. Steinhoff is currently trying to recover from its 2017 accounting scandal, which triggered a run on its shares. Britain's Heathrow Airport says the strike action scheduled for later this month has been postponed. This comes as members behind the industrial action vote on a new pay offer. According to Britain's busiest airport, its latest revised pay offer is higher than any other UK airport. Heathrow says it has a duty to ensure that its business is sustainable. Facebook has admitted that it uses an external company to listen to audio messages sent between its users. According to a recent report, the firm allegedly paid contractors to transcribe the audio messages. However, since then, the social network has issued a response citing that users who had their audio transcribed confirmed this option in its messenger app and that the practice has stopped. And finally, broadcast giant CBS and its corporate sibling Viacom have agreed to reunite in a nearly $12 billion deal. The new combined company will be called Viacom CBS. It's expected to have more than $28 billion in revenue, as well as the largest market share of about 22% of America's television viewing audience. And that's a look at your company news. Coming up to a quarter past the hour, you're watching Global Business coming up.
Investors dump South African government bonds amid fears of a credit downgrade. And the World Bank lures more investors to a new way of financing the fight against Ebola. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Every story starts out like this. Beyond the rush of the numbers, there's always a more fundamental question. What happened? Who has been affected? When market moving decisions are made, who's responsible and why? Let's get some reaction on ground. Joining us in Johannesburg is Sumitra Hello, Nairobi. This well, is how all stories begin. See how they end. Only on Global Business. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just a table mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Foreign investors have been selling South African government bonds at a high rate of roughly $130 million per day this month. In the same period, yields and benchmark government securities also jumped by 111 basis points. The latest decline comes amid fears of a credit downgrade by Moody's agency. The firm is the last of the big three credit rating companies to keep South Africa's investment grade above the junk status. However, in attempts to fix this, last week, the government increased the amount of local Local currency debt sold at weekly auctions by 37 percent but despite that effort South Africa is yet to attract a major investment inflow for a very long time many African women have not had the chance to own property due to cultural limitations however a recent survey indicates that in South Africa the tide is seemingly turning and women are leading the pack in buying residential property CGTN's Ulisa Njamila has more According to Lightstone Property Statistics, approximately 72,000 residential properties were purchased by single women in South Africa in 2018. It's a figure which surpasses the number of homes sold to men, which is around 62,000, and married couples, which is placed at around 65,000 properties. Lightstone Property provides information, valuations, and market intelligence on properties in South Africa. The survey also highlighted the fact that, in fact, women are better at budgeting and managing their money more tightly than men. 
Sandisi Wembutuma is the group MD of one of Africa's leading architectural companies. She has been in the property sector for 19 years and she can attest to the latest stats. Women are leading the pack. Um, previously, like you've said, actually male have actually been in the forefront. However, women are getting more actually um, top positions which um, translates to, um, you know, independence. And one of the manners of actually translating independence is actually ownership of property, being a homeowner, which is an asset that is always actually appreciating. While the United Nations and other bodies fight for reforms in regards to equal property ownership and inheritance, South African women continue to make progress and forge ahead. But even so, the numbers are still skewed against women. Property industry is very male-dominated. So the transformation report that came out last month, which is from the Property Sector Charter Council, depicts that actually women are still sitting at 7% in terms of voting rights and ownership, which saying across the board. Remember also residential is a subsector within the property sector. Mbutuma says now that women are making inroads in residential property ownership, they can step up even further. Property is a very important thing. So literally, I think in recent years, we're not only going to see women that are owning more homes, they will actually go to retail shopping centers. A view echoed by many other women. It's really empowering, given the fact that how long, how far actually women have come in South Africa. So them owning property just shows how strong and how women can like take care of homes and actually do whatever they want in this new South Africa. So I think it's a, it's a very awesome and empowering like, thing to do. Women need to realize what they're worth and how much they can bring to the, um, to the industry. I feel like a lot of us feel scared and, you know, uneducated on what it is what women can do for us. And owning property is a big thing. It's, it's, well, it's a long-term investment. The UN's Sustainable Development Goals reflect the importance of women's rights to land and property setting a specific target for equal rights to ownership and control over land by 2030. You listen to Jamela for CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Eritrea is regarded as one of the nations in Africa with the largest number of people residing abroad, but all that is changing now. Thanks to recent positive developments in the country, there has been a sharp rise in the number of Eritreans returning home, as CGTN's Groom Chala now explains. Thomas Asfaselase is one of Eritrea's young diaspora residing in the United States. For long, he hasn't been back home, but was sending the hard-earned cash to his parents. Things here cost so much that uh, you need help from the outside. And, you know, a lot of the people that live uh, outside of uh, Eritrea were either born here uh, or grew up here. And so we have a lot of family here. I have a lot of uncles and aunts, and my grandparents are here. So... Uh, I mean, sending money back home is, uh, is one means of uh, supporting them in the, in the way that they need. Thomas, who is a medical doctor by profession, however, felt he needed to do more than sending money here. And he took the most important steps. I actually am here working uh, with the Ministry of Health because I started a nonprofit in America to send supplies to... Uh, countries that need them and uh, my organization is called supply the change and so we've uh, managed to send about two and a half million dollars worth of supplies here so I think outside of money uh, people need to start looking at um, ways that they can come back to the country and contribute uh, outside of the monetary gains right so if I come back as a doctor um, and work in the hospitals for a few months and let's say do a few procedures for free uh, that's one way of giving back Although there is no accurate data of the number of Eritreans in the diaspora today, it is estimated that hundreds of thousands of them are settled in Europe, North America and Australia before and after independence. With the return of peace with Ethiopia at the moment, more are looking at opportunities at home. Eritrea can contribute to uh, its people and uh, as, uh, in Africa as a whole, uh, economically and politically. So um, I'm hoping um, uh, there are many 
uh, professionals uh, and then also as well as academicians who are ready to come to uh, Eritrea, not only sending money but to serve uh, mentally, physically and also professionally. Thomas, however, wants to see some improvements to be made in his country to encourage fellow diaspora to give back more. Moving forward, uh, one of the best things that can happen in this country is one, like a, um, a structured situation where if people from back home want to come back and volunteer, they know where to go rather than just talking to random people. And two, transparency between each, each different um, a entity of government, so like the Ministry of Health talking to the Ministry of Education and having the dialogue between them so, them so when we come it's not just like starting brand new. So I think moving forward that's, that's kind of one of the biggest things that I would like to see my country make. Eritrea's government is working to develop the mining sector and they are encouraging results for instance in the gold mining sector but it is the Eritrean diaspora which is majorly supporting the economy of this country. Eritreans abroad are the main and sustainable source of hard currency. Yeah, yeah. Many say more and quick work needs to be done to see a booming economy soon. Grumtara CGTN, Asmara, Eritrea. More countries, particularly in Africa, are struggling to respond to rapid disease outbreaks. That has increased the need for sources of emergency funds to tackle those medical issues. Catastrophe bonds pay some of the highest coupons in the fixed income world and mostly attract specialist fund managers. Alexandria Majala tells us how the World Bank is trying to attract more people to this type of investment. The deadly Ebola outbreak in Africa is highlighting shortcomings of so-called pandemic bonds in halting contagions. In its wake, a new way of financing the fight against global diseases has lured investors with annual returns of more than 11 percent. Two years ago, after the worst Ebola outbreak on record, the World Bank and our program called the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility began selling high-yielding securities. The lender modeled them on catastrophe bonds that pay out in response to insurance claims for events like hurricanes. The pandemic bonds, the first ever, are triggered by patterns in death from infectious diseases. For example, a $95 million tranche insuring against an Ebola virus outbreak pays investors more than $1 million each month. Critics say the bond's complicated triggering mechanism slows its ability to stem infectious contagions. For the funds to flow to Congo, the disease must cause at least 20 deaths in at least one other country within a specified time window. Deaths must also increase at a minimum rate during this period. The World Bank, however, says the bonds are part of an innovative financing mechanism designed to provide early, rapid funding to combat major disease outbreaks. Due in July 2020, the issue was a bondholder's dream offering returns found only in shaky junk-rated bonds sold from the best credit in the world and with a payout formula that was hard to trigger. According to the World Bank, the transaction was 200% oversubscribed. The premiums for the bonds, one of 11.5%, the other 6.9%, cost about $36 million a year and is paid by donor countries, including Germany and Japan. For poor countries, the facility is a source of grant funding for an outbreak for which the beneficiaries do not pay any premiums. The World Bank has made other funds available to respond to Ebola, including $300 million in grants and loans offered in July. However, the World Health Organization and its partners still need $287 million for public health operations in Congo. Alexandria Majala for CGTN. You're watching Global Business Still Ahead. U.S. President Donald Trump delays tariffs on key goods from China until December. And this one's for the dog lovers, AI tech that confirms your canine's newsprints. Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track 
the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. Penina Karibe in the heart of Nairobi, which is bustling. From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures, we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. <laughs> news that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? or what you make happen for yourself. If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live, find your voice. is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. Business in Africa is high risk. After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move. And it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiyo Koronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. A look at some of the top stories of the day. We begin in Somalia, where two suicide car bomb blasts have hit the town of Adegle. Sources say the explosions targeted a military base. Casualties have been reported, though exact numbers are still unknown. Hong Kong police pushed back hundreds of protesters who had gathered outside a police station in the residential area of Sham Shui Po in Kowloon Wednesday evening. The latest bout of clashes came hours after protesters were banned from entering the airport following the cancellation of hundreds of flights in and out of the coastal city over the past two days. And finally, Italian Interior Minister Matteo Salvini is trying to prevent two rescue ships operated by French and Spanish charities from bringing more than 500 migrants to Italy. The Ocean Viking, which is run by the French NGO Doctors Without Borders and SOS Mediterranean, has picked up some 356 migrants off the coast of Libya since Friday. And that's a look at some of the day's top stories. Let's now shift to the ongoing trade friction between the world's top two economies. U.S. President Donald Trump has unexpectedly put off new tariffs on a wide range of goods from China until December 15th. Trump, who is currently campaigning for re-election next year, says the move is designed to avoid any pain for consumers heading into the holiday season. U.S. President Donald Trump finally hinting that his tariffs could impact U.S. consumers. Now we're doing this for Christmas season. Just in case some of the tariffs would have an impact on U.S. customers, but so far they've had virtually none. The U.S. announced that it's delaying until December the new 10% tariffs on some key China-made goods, including cell phones, laptops, video game consoles, 
some toys and clothing. In addition, some products were not faced with 10% tariffs at all, including car seats, Bibles, and other religious literature. The news sent global stock markets surging higher. In the U.S., the Standard & Poor 500 Nasdaq and Dow Jones had been plunging for days, with the Dow falling about 5% over the first two trading days this week. The latest round of tariffs announced by Trump two weeks ago on $300 billion on Chinese goods had been due to take effect on September 1st. The news came just after U.S. and Chinese negotiators met in Shanghai in late July for the first time since talks collapsed in May. The sides were due to hold another round of meetings in Washington in September. However, relations deteriorated after Trump's abrupt announcement of new tariffs. And last Friday, Trump said the next meeting might not happen, saying the U.S. was not ready to make a deal. Then another dramatic turn. The current delay or canceling of some tariffs came after top U.S. and Chinese trade officials spoke by telephone early Tuesday. During the phone call, Chinese Vice Premier Liu He and Commerce Minister Zhong Shan lodged a protest against the tariffs to U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. They agreed to talk again in two weeks. Trump said the conversation was, quote, very productive. Despite the brief reprieve on tariffs, Washington and Beijing are still at odds over Huawei. President Donald Trump said he would not do any business with the Chinese telecommunications giant. But he did leave the door open to future business if and when the trade war ends. CGTN's Jim Spellman, Spellman has more. A new rule prohibits the U.S. government from buying telecommunications and video surveillance products from five Chinese firms, including Huawei and ZTE. The U.S. claims Huawei and other Chinese firms could share user data with the Chinese government or even launch hacking attacks on U.S. networks. Huawei and the other companies deny any wrongdoing. The U.S. has provided no evidence of any risk. There won't be much immediate impact. These firms have little involvement in U.S. government contracting. Concerns about Huawei date back to the Obama administration. But President Trump has sometimes portrayed Huawei as a national security issue and at other times as a trade issue. It's much simpler not to do any business with Huawei, so we're not doing business with Huawei. That doesn't mean we won't agree to something if and when we make a trade deal. Huawei also faces a separate ban on purchasing U.S. components or software used in its smartphones. Huawei is pushing back, suing the U.S. government and rolling out a new operating system that could replace Google's Android OS if needed. Despite headwinds from the U.S., Huawei reports strong growth in the first half of 2019, but acknowledges more risk ahead. Our business result for the first half was quite good, and we achieved a stable growth. But objectively, we are facing many difficulties. In the second half and next year, these difficulties are quite challenging. Perhaps no wall has more infamy than the Berlin Wall. Huawei has released this video warning that trade disputes could create a digital Berlin Wall, a technological and economic divide between countries aligned with China and those aligned with the U.S. We must learn from history. No more walls in terms of trade. No more walls in terms of technology. This world needs an integrated global ecosystem that can help us promote faster technological innovation and stronger economic growth. Meantime, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton traveled to London to meet with the representatives of Boris Johnson's new government, hoping to convince the U.K. to join the U.S. in blocking Huawei. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Washington. Argentine President Mauricio Macri has announced plans for salary hikes and tax cuts after voters turned resoundingly against his austerity policies. Macri, who is seeking re-election in October, says he will cut income taxes for workers, increase subsidies, as well as introduce a 90-day freeze on fuel prices to help ease Argentina's economic shock. For those who pay taxes for profits, we will modify the tax so that they receive around 2,000 pesos more in the pocket per month until the end of the year. There are also benefits for the mono-tribute and for the informal workers and unemployed, through two extra payments of AUH that they receive for their children to the employees of the public administration, the armed forces and the security forces, we are going to give them a bonus of 5,000 pesos at the end of the month. 
Colombia has declared a national state of emergency following the confirmation of a dreaded fungus in its banana plantations. The latest discovery represents a potentially impending disaster for bananas as both a food source and an export commodity. Particularly in Latin America, experts have long feared that the fungus, popularly known as the Panama disease, could spread. The continent is the epicenter of the global banana export industry. This means that a large and contained outbreak could be devastating for the local economy, potentially causing worldwide repercussions. In the meantime, the government of Colombia says efforts are underway to contain the outbreak. The presence of the Fusarium fungus continues to be contained in the area of the La Guajira on 175 hectares, which is approximately 432 acres on six banana plantations. Well, the worry now is that a lot of people are being left without work. Banana plantations have closed. Several have already shut down. The one right over here closed down. They're going to close this one too and that one because there's a lot of disease there and it's damaging the whole banana plantation. As more Chinese people embrace the joy of owning a pet, the need for better pet management is increasing too. CGTN's Lu Sirui takes us to a Chinese artificial intelligence company that sees an opportunity in this. Have you ever been troubled when a pet has gone missing or scared by an angry dog off his leash? Well, think about a society where everyone pitches in to help locate a lost dog by uploading a couple of photos or identifying a troublemaking dog that's bitten someone. Recently, a so-called dog face recognition platform launched by a private company is offering such possibility. As every human being has its distinct fingerprint, every dog has its own identifiable features on their noses. The program developer hopes that a few photos taken of dogs' faces will help to confirm their identity. MegaV is a Chinese artificial intelligence company with eight years of human facial recognition experience. They are now applying similar technology to dogs. On their pet ID platform, owners can register their pets via smartphone. They fill in their own information and then upload pictures of their dog's noses. Compared to chip injection, our method is easier, cheaper and safer. The technology can also identify and authenticate dogs by comparing information of photos from different dogs. This can help enormously in finding lost dogs and notifying pet owners by identifying that their dogs are in trouble. In the past, when we tried to find lost dogs, we used manpower. It wasn't accurate at all. Now the AI technology is empowering human beings with the ability to differentiate between different dogs. The accuracy can be as high as 95%. Data shows that number of Chinese households with pets hit 99 million in 2018. Building a database for pets and owners is only a small step before China establishes a complete registration system for the booming market. This technology, however, cannot exist without government participation or society's engagement. The attitude of local governments, especially in first-tiered and second-tiered cities, towards companion animals has improved considerably. They're also becoming more aware that the city's attitude towards pets reflects the reputation of the city. We hope a solid registration mechanism can soon be established. The company also says that they are planning to expand this technology to identify other types of pets. Lu Surei, CGTN, Beijing. Let's look at the commodities market. All prices fall today. Disappointing economic data from China and Europe and the rise in U.S. crude inventories partly erasing the previous session's sharp gains after the U.S. said it would delay tariffs on some Chinese products. You're watching Global Business still ahead. A recycling project keeps South African township streets clean while creating employment for the community. And a Mali innovator creates a voice app for people that cannot read. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better.
CGTN. See the difference. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival, and hope. Uh. Oh. So let's explore. CGTN, see the difference. Don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. The Changshi recycling business in South Africa is championing the cause for a clean environment and creating jobs in the community. Makabisi Recycling was started in 2007. It keeps hundreds of tons of PET bottles and other harmful plastic waste out of the environment. South Africa has seen a 6% year-on-year increase in PET bottle recycling through a growing consumer awareness. CGTN's Julie Shire reports. Makabitsi Recycling is scooping up awards for being an environmental champion. The 100% women-owned business was started by Anna Hartvist more than 10 years ago to fight poverty and create jobs in her community. I did see that there's a lot of people who are not working. Then I tried to get the people to work with me so that we can start the thing. Then 2016, we were nominated in the Township Entrepreneur. Then 2016, again, ESCOM nominated us as well. Then the thing, it just started from there, that I did realize now that I'm a businesswoman. Anna runs the company with her daughter, Harriet. They employ more than 60 people and recycle over 20 tons of plastic waste every month. Once always come here, the guys sort the recyclables according to different products, and we press it, we have a bailing machine, and we transport it further to the manufacturers. Makhabisi Recycling not only creates jobs and a steady income for many residents in this township, it also teaches the community here about the importance of repurposing waste and keeping the environment clean. This initiative has created so much awareness for, towards our community because even the kids, the children, they come here with bottles and they know that they'll definitely get value for the recyclables. And also everyone is more involved in the cleanliness of the community. So everyone knows that recycling is a thing that must happen. As the country honors its women in August, Anna reflects on the role females play in nurturing and empowering their communities to break the poverty trap. All the years, women, let me say, it, we didn't know. We were only raising the children. But now, since the government did uh, realize that women can stand on their, on their feet, then that is why I'm really always happy to see the women to be in business. I will be very happy if one day I can see one of them doing the very same thing which I'm doing. Anna has kept her operations in the township so people don't have to travel long distances to sell their trash. She hopes her business model can be replicated in other townships and poor communities around the world. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. 
Still in South Africa, a local chicken outlet has officially announced the removal of plastic straws in over 900 restaurants across the country, helping to eliminate 60 million plastic straws a year. Wits University is now showcasing an exhibition known as the Final Straw, displaying all the straws that the chicken outlet has discarded. This time, the straws have been transformed into art, a fascinating spectacle, as CGTN's Ulisa Njamela reports. The announcement of the removal of the plastic straws by the local chicken outlet forms part of a new global sustainability commitment from the business sector that all plastic-based packaging items will be recoverable or reusable by 2025. In addition to this, and as part of its ongoing efforts to adopt more sustainable practices, the brand has already removed disposable plastic beverage cups from its KFC head office. It's all in the name of contributing to saving the environment. And those straws are now here at the Origin Center at Vets University in a form of an exhibition. This is a, something very different for Origin Center. It's an exhibition about KFC getting rid of plastic straws. They're moving to, from plastic straws to paper straws, um, and they, they thought of making this an, an important event, preserving the last plastic straw and preserving it like in our, in our pillars that we have archaeologically and stratigraphically, that that was the age that we've now forgotten. There's two exhibitions that are made out of plastic straws. One symbolizing a wave of plastic straws, all the plastic and the plastic straws that find their way into the ocean. And then another one's a, a beautiful tree made out of plastic straws. According to the United Nations, around 8 million tons of plastic ends up in the sea every year. That's an equivalent of a truckload of rubbish being dumped in the ocean every minute. So this local chicken outlet is helping to eliminate at least 60 million plastic straws per year. So and you just think that's one fast food chain, how many plastic straws are being produced in South Africa every year. So getting rid of those 60 million plastic straws from KFC is a big thing. So to encourage other outlets and other producers to, or food producers to, to move to paper straws rather. While plastic has many valuable uses, Humanity has become addicted to single-use or disposable plastic with severe environmental consequences. But the African continent is not sitting idle. According to the United Nations, within the last four years in Africa, more than 58% of the African countries have in some way banned plastic use. And these straws that formulate this display will also be disposed of responsibly after the exhibition. You're listening to Jambala for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Let's go to Mali, where an entrepreneur has created an app for people that can't read. It's called the Lenali Vocal app, and it works with voice instructions in several languages spoken in the country. CGTN's Stuli Shabalala shows us how the app has helped small businesses market their goods and services. In the streets of Mali's capital, Bamako, we find Ada Tembeli. She is amongst a growing number of entrepreneurs who are illiterate. Tembeli has now found a novel way to do business through social media. It's called the Lenali Vocal app. Tembeli attracts customers by sending a voice message with her stall's location. Here are your lovely fruits. We have nice ripe oranges, apples, bananas, without forgetting to mention the pineapples. Today we have almost everything to keep you satisfied. To find us, go to the third bridge and you will see me. The app allows her to take pictures of the fruits and vegetables she has available on the day. Tembeli says her earnings have tripled since she started using the app. Mali is a multilingual country and the Lenali app translates most of them. I installed it myself because Lenali has Bambara, Soninke and almost all the languages. I haven't gone to school and I don't understand French. This app is helpful because it uses my Bambara language. Lenali was developed by IT engineer Mamadou Guro Sidibe. He wanted to create an application that could be used by people who could not read or write as well as help those who needed to share information in French. 
A lot of people get applications installed for them because they cannot do it themselves. So, it is with that in mind that we created vocal guides and vocal instructions in the local language so people can understand what they are doing. If you know how to write, you can put it in writing. And if not, you can speak into the application and record it. And after that, you can publish vocally, you can comment vocally, and really, you can do everything in this application without ever having to write a single word. According to the United Nations, only 33% of Malians are literate. Before the application, most small business owners in Mali relied on friends, family, and word of mouth to keep them going. Since I started using Lenali, my turnover has gone up by 5%, and now I can sell 20 motorbikes a day, whereas before I was hardworking but just selling five a day. Lenali has become popular in the country. The free app has been available since January 2017. It has over 70,000 users. Its developer expects it to be profitable when it reaches 200,000 users. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. And looking at the currencies, a spike in concern that the global economy is headed towards a synchronized economic downturn. Put pressure on the rand today, pushing it near to an 11-month low. It traded today at those figures you see here on this board. And with that, we come to the end of Global Business. We invite your feedback, send it to the contacts on the screen and follow us on our digital media platform. I'm Penina Karibe. Thank you for watching.